Hi, everybody. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? Um, I, firstly, I'm really, really delighted to be here. Um, I must say that I've, I've done this a number of times, but I'm really nervous about this one because my old siang, uh, my hero is here. I always tell people when I grow up, I want to be Denise Pua. I, I, I think it's not often in life that you uh, meet very, very, very sincere people and people who really do things like really from the heart and, and you know, without pomp and circumstance. And I, I, um, I thought kind of like about what you know, I want to talk about. And I was asking my manager, Francis, and, and she said, you know, why, why don't you do what you do best, which is... Um, I, I've been in the media industry for, well, I'm very old, 15 years now, and um, what I've been trained to do is to tell stories. And um, the storytelling changes all the time, and, and the way we, I've started to tell stories change all the time. And I thought, I will come here today and tell you a whole bunch of stories. Uh, and I, I just wanted to kind of tell you really about the amazing people that I've met in my journey in the past, uh, I would say since 2000, yeah, since 2000. So uh, we have 15 years, so we should start. Well, my, my, what, my interesting part of my journey kind of started after the Miss Universe pageant because that's kind of when I started to be introduced into volunteer work. Um, my first stint was with the Topaya Girls Home. And I'm just going to just, just, just tell you one story there, just very, very quickly. And uh, I went there actually to do a talk because I was introduced to them by the National Volunteer and Philanthropy Centre. And they said, you know, because uh, I wanted to, to do something with my reign. And they said, why don't you just go and, and give a talk at the home? They're looking for people to come and just talk to the girls. So I went there and just shared their experience. I was fresh off uh, uh, from, the Miss, from the Miss Universe pageant. So I was just kind of telling them what it was like, you know, what I had to do. And so I told them, I said, I'm going to come back in November of 2000. And I actually made a conscious effort to then, you know, kind of fit that into my schedule because... I realized after spending that afternoon with them that a lot of these youths were always given promises, but not many people kind of fulfilled that promise with them. And so I started befriending, what they call befriending. And it was really amazing because, you know, you just spend time talking to these 15, 16-year-olds who've been through so much in their life and they're only 15. And then there was one day where um, I remember I was given a gift. So they made, this girl made me a little gift and it was, um, it was a, a paper box and inside it was um, a, a soap and they had like cotton around it and it said, you know, thank you. And, um, and, and it was a note. So after I, I, I kind of left the home, I... I sat on, you know, I was just by the roadside and I, I opened it up and I read the note and I just, I really cried because it was kind of the first time I experienced, um, it was the first time I experienced somebody actually saying, you know, a very heartfelt thank you to me. And that actually was um, kind of sparked off. At, at that point in time, I realized that, you know, this is what I want to do. And that actually started my journey in volunteering. So I, 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 I was very privileged to work with them, with Andrew and, and Grace Home, and then of course I started work uh, with the, 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 the YECs as well in Ang Mokyo. So anyway, um, kind of my, my stories that I'm going to tell you about kind of started here when I, uh, after 2009, actually after I finished um, my term as an NMP. In 2010, it was a very bleak year for me, um, which kind of why I wanted to bring this up. This is probably one of the only few words you're going to see in my presentation. Um, I thought of the talk which is in search of purpose and I thought, okay, maybe I should try and link it a little bit. Um, and I, I thought about 2010 and, you know, sometimes people always see the very beautiful side of your life and it's like, oh, wow, everything's wonderful. But I think that, you know, I want to talk a little bit also about the struggles that I've, I've not, well, I wouldn't call it struggles, lah, but some of the hard times that I've had to face. But the thing about these struggles is that they're quite amazing. That's why I use the word struggle because I look at, I've had the privilege to have been, just met so many amazing people. And I realized for me as well that struggle actually reinforces purpose. That every time you have to, you know, work at something harder or, you know, you get, you know, thrown back, things thrown back in your face even though you thought you gave it your best and everything. But, you know, sometimes it actually reinforces the why you want to do what you do. This is Alvina Neo, and this is uh, Qian Yin. Um, we were filming with them for Women Talk TV, uh, which I'm going to start talking to you a little bit about. Alvina Neo, uh, she had spina bifida when she was really uh, young, um, and um, she is a head, she became a hand cyclist, and then but now because of a shoulder injury, she's now a, she just took up air pistol, and she's now going to represent Singapore at the ASEAN Paragames. Qian Yin. Um, 
had leukemia when she was young. And then after that, it came back again. And at 17, the doctor asked her, well, you now have a spinal cord inflammation. So you either save your life or you save your legs. And at 17, she had to make this decision. And I sat there and interviewed the both of them. And they are just incredible. They just, they are fervor for life. It's like, you know, the amazing thing, right? When you talk to, to a lot of the para-athletes, it's like, no, la, like that, la, uh, okay. La. I mean, I wouldn't call it struggle. La, you know, it's, it's all right. La, I had to do certain things, but it made me stronger. So every one of them, every one of them, there's this reinforced message. And even though we will never, and I will never fully ever understand whatever that they had to go through, but it's just their strength and how they've overcome what they've had to overcome and not, not, a, not a word, not a, an ounce of self-pity, you know, when they talk to you about what they have to overcome. So this was, this is the reason why I do what I do. It's these women that I meet all the time, um, you know, for Women Talk TV that really, really reinforce my purpose in life. So 2010 was a tough year for me because I kind of finished up the NMP thing and then I, I, I went back into hosting and acting, but I, I felt suddenly there was like a huge gaping hole in my life where I, I, I just couldn't find that sense of fulfillment anymore. I mean, I love what I do in the media industry, but I just felt that something was really missing in my life. And I, I wanted to kind of find that purpose in my life again and why I was, you know, what, what's the next step? What do I do? So it was a, it's a really tough year. And, um, but I, so I started hosting and acting again, and then I was doing this show. Um, it was like a variety show, and... Um, there was this lady on the show and she said to me, she said, my husband didn't want to take me out of the house because I put on a lot of weight and it's only when I started to lose the weight that he was proud to kind of bring me out of the house again. And this really, really, really affected me because um, I, it's not like you don't know that these things are happening, but when somebody tells that to you in your face, it kind of, you know, changes a lot of things. And so I went for dinner with my team, with Francis, my manager, my cousin was there, um, my makeup artist, and I said, I said, how many other women out there are experiencing things like that and think it's normal? Or how many women out there are experiencing things like that and they just don't have anybody to talk to? Or they think like, you know, they are alone in this situation. And that's literally how Women Talk TV began. Then I thought to myself, you know, kind of what is my purpose? My purpose is to leverage on what I've learned in the media and use what I know to kind of create that conversation so that women could start talking about these things because that's why it's called Women Talk because women like to talk but sometimes we don't necessarily yes we do uh, <laughs> we don't necessarily talk about things that that really matter to us or that you know we find um, that either if there's a stigma attached to it or, or you know or that we're embarrassed about or we think that we should be embarrassed about so that's how literally how Women Talk TV um, started and, and actually what I've learned from being in the media is that being in the media is really about giving voice. There's no point really just kind of hosting a show and acting if you're not actually giving voice to people. So Women Talk TV started for two reasons. One is that we wanted everyday women to inspire each other with their stories. And the other reason was we wanted women in certain situations to know that they're not alone and that there's help out there. So Women Talk TV really is a show about everyday women who are extraordinary. And, um, you know, sometimes we don't feature super, super like, famous women. It's because they already have their voice and they already have their platform. And I think it's the unsung heroines in society that we really want to, you know, kind of feature and talk about. So anyway, we started Women Talk TV and um, it was tough because it's largely still self-funded. That's why I don't really take day-offs. Um, I still have to work to kind of support it. But um, it's on a web, it's on a portal. And um, initially, we tried to pitch it to different people and everything and... We had like cut a, quite a few doors slammed in our faces and, you know, because it wasn't like a money-making scheme. And, um, but we, 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 we wanted to put it out there and, um, and we did. And, and we started in 2012 to shoot all these videos. And so we, we started with Pinsu, who um, she had muscular dystrophy, but she's an amazing, amazing swimmer. Um, Rachel, who is a survivor of domestic abuse, and now she helps women um, um, uh, with domestic abuse, who have suffered domestic abuse. Uh, Lena Sim, you might be familiar with, she, um, she owns Ministry of Food, and uh, she was abandoned at birth um, because her pa zi, which is the Chinese eight characters, right, were too strong. So the feng shui guy told the parents that if, uh, because her pa zi is so strong, right, uh, her eight characters are so strong, it's actually not good for her brother, so she was abandoned and her grandmother actually brought her up and she used to rummage through trash for food. And now she's one of the most successful 
uh, on uh, uh, restauranteurs in Singapore. Uh, Haslina, uh, who's a Malaysian, the rest are all Singaporean. Um, uh, Haslina is a rape survivor, but she also then started uh, um, a shelter for rape survivors in Malaysia. And I'll tell you a little bit about her in a minute. And Shamala um, is, uh, uh, she started this thing called Big is Gorgeous, B-I-G, to empower plus-size women because she felt that, you know, how come there are no plus-size models? There's no plus-size magazine. So she kind of just like, oh, nobody's doing it. I'll just start it anyway. We kind of just launched season three. So I can't believe we have done about 24 episodes uh, in the past few years. So uh, that's her. So I have a little story about this. Um, Haslina was our eighth interview for season one. So we were planning to shoot 2012 and 2000 and half of 2013. I was shooting two things, Women Talk TV and 350, the movie, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. So we, we wanted to shoot eight videos for Women Talk TV and then launch it uh, on our portal and you know, do big launch and all that. So I spent 2012 shooting these eight videos. And Haslina was actually my last video of the eight. The, yeah. the, that year itself was tough because I was actually not drawing a salary and I was just kind of exhausting my savings. Um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, and, and I, I kind of wanted to give Women Talk TV up and I thought, okay, you know what, this is enough. I have to go back to work. It's just ridiculous. I can't do this anymore because my time was split between the movie and, and Women Talk TV. And I said, okay, we'll just, I'll just put the eight videos out there and I'm done. You know, and then we, this was a great project and you know, unfortunately, I just can't sustain it anymore. And we went for the interview and it was an extremely emotional interview. Not because we you know, talked about the rape itself, but she said something that really, really, really hit me. And she said, sometimes it's not the rape that hurts the woman, but the fact that she doesn't have community and family support. And she said, and that hurts more than the act itself. So anyway, anyway, after the interview, um, I told Haslina, I said, thank you, because I know it's hard for you to have to relive this and talk about this. And, you know, it's not an easy topic. And to put yourself out there in, you know, in front of so many people, it's not, it really takes a lot of courage. And she said one thing to me that changed the course of my life. And she said, well, Eunice, I did the interview, but you are the one showing it. And if you don't tell the stories, then nobody will know them. And because she said that to me, I told myself that I will never ever, no matter what, I will never ever give up Women Talk TV. Even I have to work weekends and nights and what to sustain this. I will never give it up. Because Women Talk TV for me, it's not just a program anymore. It's become a duty and it's become a responsibility. And it's just amazing how, you know, we've had all these Amazing stories. I mean, if you ever have time, you know, if, if you want, you know, you can go and watch some of their stories. But um, we uh, were very fortunate because for three years, kind of, you know, I mean, we couldn't get any funding. <laughs> it, was, it was sometimes really, you know, kind of um, demoralizing because you are trying to do something that you really believe in. It was really tough. But in 2014, we got an email while I was in New York that um, we got nominated for an international Emmy. We didn't win, but we got nominated for an international Emmy. And Francis and I went to Cannes. I think what was really important for us was this. Um, there are four nominees in this category, and all of them were TV stations. And, you know, and, and what this meant for us wasn't just like, oh, look, you guys doing a great job. But all the other nominees came up to tell us, and this was really amazing because it proved not that, wow, we're doing such a great job, but it proved one thing. It proved that we were doing the women justice. And that for me is really, really important because we were telling the stories the right way. To I think I will not do justice to Women Talk TV if I don't have you let you have a glimpse of it. So um, we've actually cut a little video um, for all of you. And uh, it's just a, a combination of some of the stories. So I hope you enjoy it. I'll just step off stage for a while. Let's talk Women Talk. I can never imagine my life without muscular dystrophy now. It's like, it occupies such a big role in my life. Without muscular dystrophy, I would not have taken up competitive swimming. The one to keep me strength is uh, love. When I see the animal get abused, I have a mother instinct. I want to protect them, I want to work for them and make them out from harm. When I feel like giving up, I think of our cheesemaker, Maricel. She's the reason why I stay on and do this in spite of all the hiccups. She used to toil under the scorching sun every morning to sell her eggplants. But now she gets to work just a few meters from home and she still gets to look after her kids and make so much more. I 
had to do the dishes, wash the toilet, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. So um, it, it, it did train me and, and put me in the, the right mindset. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I have one disability. I, I can use that as an excuse, and I still have to find different ways around um, achieving what I want to achieve without sight. You love him even after, even after he hit you. Uh, I think it's worse when there is love, you know, because you will then feel that the betrayal is even sharper, it's even more painful. Uh, we are questioning ourselves if we are working effectively, you know, because the, um, the situation is not changed, you know. But I think we make change to the people we work with whose life, you know, have been uh, destroyed, but they have new life and they started, you know, again. And I think the hope lies in the hands of the people of Burma. What is empowerment to you? Empowerment is when a woman is able to stand up, speak up without being censured. She's an empowered woman. Yeah, so that's the little show that we have. Um, yeah, so anyway, Women Talk TV, um, we are in our third season now, and, and so, and we're doing, uh, that's why I spend the weekend with Tianin and Alvinia, because we're doing a para, ASEAN para athlete special, we're very excited. So we're featuring four para athletes from Singapore, uh, Alvinia, Tianin, uh, Teresa Goh, which uh, maybe some of you may be familiar with, she's amazing. Uh, I was told at one point that Teresa could, uh, before her shoulder injury, you could strap her down to a wheelchair and she could do pull-ups. And that's how strong she is. She's really incredible. Really incredible. So we went for a 5km run once and, um, you know, she kind of outran all of us. Uh, she's maybe... And, and Aisha, another uh, air rifle shooter as well. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I just cannot uh, articulate how um, inspired I've been uh, meeting these women and just, just the lives and the stories that they tell. So anyway, this is 350. Uh, it's a film that I made in, well, I co-produced it and acted in it in 2012. Uh, we, well, we premiered it in 2013 on human trafficking. Uh, a very long time ago, I was involved in an INGO, uh, international governmental organization, and I actually met uh, women who had been trafficked. And um, for a very, very long time, this is 2006, so very long time, uh, the stories always stayed at the back of my mind. And I always ask myself, you know, how can we use the media as a platform to, to, to really increased awareness of, on human trafficking. Human trafficking is actually the third or second most, um, uh, what do you call that, lucrative illegal, uh, illegal trade after drugs and illegal arms. Um, so I did this movie, uh, in, and I spent 2012 going back and forth in Cambodia to do a lot of research uh, in this area. Um, so <laughs> when I was in uh, um, Cambodia in 2012 doing research for my film, I, it was by, just by chance that um, I was introduced to all these different organizations that I wanted to speak to the social workers to, to understand the topic better because what we wanted to do in the film was to give more or less an accurate depiction of what human trafficking was about. We didn't want to sensationalize it. We didn't want to undo any of the good work that the NGOs were doing. It was very important to us. Um, and so I, I spoke to quite a few NGOs and I got to know... Um, this team that works for a hospital called the Sahanuk Hospital Centre of Hope in Cambodia. They do amazing work. They work with evicted communities and people living with HIV. So I happened to be there in, over Chinese New Year in 2012. And um, I, you know, somebody told me, hey, you should follow them out, you know, into the community since you're quite interested in humanitarian work. So I did. And that kind of... It, that kind of changed my life a lot as well because I still work to them until today and they are like my family in Cambodia. Um, they, like, I'm, I love their children and I, I, they are really my family and, and we, I see them all the time and they're just such incredible people. And um, one month before I was there, there was a huge land grab and a lot of people were evicted from the city area and in 50 kilometers out of the city. So they brought me to the initial eviction uh, area where everybody was staying and then they brought me to the, the place where the people were evicted to. Um, basically, that was their house. It was just like a wooden plank with four poles and a canvas sheet on top and they were staying in the middle of this like... Well, it was just like an open field, like a huge open field. So they're exposed to the elements, the sun. So the women, the pregnant women, the children, 
you know, the men, everybody, they had no toilets and this was their house. There's no privacy, nothing. When I, when I, when I met them, so I asked my team, I said, you know, well, at the time, you know, they were the social workers that I knew and they said, and I said, what, you know, what can we do? Because some of them were evicted to only 10 kilometers away and they said, oh, this guy needs a bicycle to go to work. So I'm like, okay, how much is a bicycle? 50 bucks. I'm like, cool, let's buy a bicycle for this guy, you know, so he can continue working. So it kind of started like that. It was not like, there was no thought process at that point. It was just like, um, okay, what does he need? What does she need? Like, you know, so it started off and now I call it the GAP project. There is no organization. I did not found an NGO. So you won't see my name anywhere on these projects, which is good. Um, it's just the, the volunteers and the people who have contributed to the projects that I'm very grateful to. So we just want, I mean, I, I thought, okay, let's just do GAP projects because sometimes organizations, big organizations cannot serve all the needs. So as individuals, you might not be able to do like really big things, but if you bought a $50 bicycle for someone, the person would then be able to go back to work the next day. You know, so we, it just started there and, and now it's, it's kind of grown a little bit, but but so I, I just kind of kept asking my team, so what's next? What do they need? And they said, oh, uh, there was another evicted community. There are about 100 families there and they've been living there for three years without toilets. Then I'm like, oh, okay, so how do we do that then? So we had to, you know, we had to start doing a small fundraising and it wasn't, it was like 100 bucks a toilet, I think. So I, had a, I was having dinner with a friend from Hong Kong and I just said, oh, um, yeah, so I was telling him the story. I had just come back from Cambodia. And I said, yeah, there's about, you know, 100 families. So it's like, I don't know, 11,000. I don't have that kind of money. So he was like, I'll sponsor you lah. Then I was like, then he's like, yeah, yeah, toilet's not very glamorous. I never remember I give you. So now, uh, he's <laughs> his name is Harold. We call him the Toilet King. So every time my birthday, he like, Eunice, I'll buy for you three more toilets. So, <laughs> so Harold um, came with us actually to Cambodia and he officiated the ceremony. He saw the toilets that he built. And then, you know, it, I, you, there were so many tes like, testimonies from the villagers and they were telling us that, you know, it's not just about the sanitation, but it was really to really um, kind of uh, um, protect the dignity of the people. And it really was that. And also, I, one more thing was to protect the vulnerability of the women. So that kind of um, sparked off a little idea. Um, then I thought, women, toilets, sanitation, ooh, sanitary pads. So I asked my team, I said, so is there kind of some kind of like a, a menstrual hygiene education here? They're like, no, 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 no. We don't talk about it. You know, there's, there's not a lot of that. Some people use sanitary pads, some people don't. So this sparked off another gap project and I thought, okay, why don't we create a feminine hygiene education program for women and young girls in rural communities? Um, so I spent three days in Cambodia and we educated about... Well, we helped to teach about a thousand women and young, uh, young girls about menstrual hygiene. And we gave them a couple of sanitary pads as well and did a quiz for them. So then we thought, um, you know, since we have the program, uh, we didn't have any big plans for the program or anything. We thought, why not? Why don't we just kind of give the program to people to use? So that, that's Project Precious, which is a feminine hygiene program. But we never thought, like, it would, you know, kind of have a life of its own. It just started off as just a gap project. And I guess the, the, the point is sometimes you don't think that, you know, you just do it because you don't always have to think about, wow, how can this be like big? Because sometimes you change one, two, three, four, five people's lives and that's five more. And I'm sure you've heard this before, there's five more than... And I've actually personally experienced it and it's, it's really very impactful and you don't know how that five people, it will have a multiplier effect because then, then they will empower another five each. So this is my team. Um, they're not my team, but I work with them. And um, that's my tuk-tuk driver, Lala. Uh, T, Chanda, and Mr. Widget. Mr. Widget used to be like a village chief. And then because he loved the work in the NGO, and when he goes into the community, he's like a complete hero. I remember there was one time I was distributing, um, it was International Women's Day, and I was distributing like sanitary pads and like, you know, um, underwear and stuff. And he was like taking them out and showing them to the women and they were all like in laughter. And, and they, she, they just connect so well to the community and they really are my heroes. And these are really the people, um, uh, uh, the reason why I do what I do, even though um, I can't really sustain it all the time. But I, I keep doing it because they really have impacted my life. Like they earn nothing. Not tea. There's this other guy, Chavlet, he's not here, but... Um, he had always had an opportunity to go to the US because his mom's there and he can easily go there. But he always tells me, he says, you know, you know what? I don't want to go to the US because I feel at peace with my people here. I feel this is what I need to do for my people. And 
I've, I've really, you know, had the privilege to work with them and how they impact the community and how they just do things really, really from their heart. And they don't have a lot of money, but yet they find such purpose uh, in serving the people and serving the communities. And my journey has, is what it is today really because of them, really because I've been inspired since Topayo Girls' Home into working with the, the Youth Executive Committee in Amokyo to uh, the Teen Advisory Council to um, the Eurasians Association at some point <laughs> um, to the to you know the, the different communities that I've worked with and um, and 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 finally to, to this wonderful team. Yeah. So um, Th there's one more that I really need to talk about also, um, which is the Muscular Dystrophy Association of Singapore. We couldn't really find like pictures and stuff. But anyway, um, there's one boy there, Kei Chung, whom I and he's like my brother. So Kei Chung I is um, he. He, I mean, he, he has muscular dystrophy, but he loves the piano, and I love the piano. And we met uh, at MDAS because we had to go and buy sushi for everybody. And that's kind of started our friendship, and I found out he likes to play piano. So we just started playing together a little bit. And, like, you know, I've been playing the piano for a very long time. Uh, and I've had the privilege to, to play piano with, um, with people who are hearing impaired, with Kei Chung. And when they play music, it's different. It's just different. I sometimes I can't describe it, but it's just that 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 depth and the passion they put into the music and the thing that I take for granted so much that he struggles with. It, and and Kei Chung has really kind of reinforced my passion for music as well. And how even though it never worked out as my career, but it's always um, something that I I feel I can use purposefully. So Kei Chung. Kei Chung is a big part of my life as well, and so is MDAS. And um, I mean, these kids really inspire me. A lot of times, I think I ask myself in my life, what really is, what really I should be doing, or what is the purpose? Or, and, and I think it's these people. It's these people that you meet when you volunteer, or when you work in a community, or when you work in a small project. They really inspire you to want to do better, to want to be better, and just, in, and just want to live life like, and do more. And so I, I thought about, you know, what I wanted to kind of end with. And, and, I, and I thought, you know, if you look at the world in a different perspective and you look at the privileges that we have, and especially as Singaporeans, and I have to say this, I'm a woman and I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a minority. And where I am today will not happen, maybe, if I was in the same economic strata if I'm in a different country. And I really, really appreciate that and have so much to thank for. And when you realize your privileges, that you know you 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 find that there's so much more that you can do than what you think you can do, and what society says that you can do. And it's okay if it's a small project. It's okay if you're doing like five things at the same time, and not all of them are sustainable, or all of them are earning you tons of money. But really, like the people that you impact and the projects that you're working on. You know, and that will inspire you. The, the the kind of the impact that creates, and I'm sure a lot of you have had a chance maybe to volunteer, and it kind of that I I, I find it very addictive. That I think until today there are days where I don't want to get out of bed and don't want to go to work, not because I don't love my work, but because I'm tired and just very tired. But I I we have an app. Yeah. I I open the app and I watch one women talk TV program. It's three minutes or five minutes, and that reminds me about why I'm alive, you know. And, and I think really once you realize the privileges and you look at the world and you say, you know what, there's so much more that I can do. Even if everybody else says that you can't, you know, if, as long as you feel that you can create that impact on one person's life, it really, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's a huge privilege and a huge blessing as well. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you.